going to do great things. We must be a little daring. We can change the course of history. Hi, Calvin. Hey, hi, Weruche. How, how are you guys doing? Good. good. How are you? Pretty good. Um, I'm going to start with you, Weruche, uh, because I know that you played in Top Boy and, and Black Mirror. You did your research. I appreciate you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean I'll, you know may, maybe not as huge a role as Coretta and uh Scott King in mm -hmm. in the past. I just I just wanted to know like how does it feel to step into you know a, a role of somebody that's you know such a living um I mean such a legend of you know for our lifetime yes. and that everybody's familiar with like how was that preparing for that role as different than preparing for your, your other roles? Um, absolutely terrifying, but equally as exciting. Um, this is the first time I've ever played someone who's a real person, who's walked the face of the earth. And of course I pick somebody like Coretta Scott King to be my first time. Um, I was very scared, but also very excited. And I mean, obviously knowing who she is, it is the big one of the biggest honors of my life, I will say. Absolute privilege. And so I took it with the most respect, reverence, and responsibility, wanting to do my absolute best job and to represent her well, um, to show my understanding of who she is, who she was, what she's done, and just um hoping that I, I can give her you know, just bring a little bit more life to her in this new generation so people can be reminded or learn about the woman that was Coretta Scott King. And Kelvin, I mean, I know that 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 you hail from NOLA, so you have like the, you know, some Southern um, roots in you, but the distinctive uh, speaking style of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, like how, what, what was the challenge of getting into that oratory space and how did you practice to get the cadence and rhythm of trying to portray uh, him vocally? Yeah, it was one of the things I was kind of most concerned about. And I try, you know, as an actor, you don't ever want to fall into those traps of doing the impersonation. But mm -hmm. at the same time, <clears throat> it's, you know, he's an orator. We know his voice. We love his voice. His voice is the voice of a nation, the voice of a people. So I had to give it my best shot. And I've been using the same dialect coach since I first started in this game in 2016. And um, I sent it to him. I was like, let's break it down. We picked some speeches that we loved. And then we found some audio recordings of him on the phone with LBJ. And I was like, well, there's a different texture there. So maybe this will be his at home voice when we want to get into more of those intimate spaces, those private moments. And then there's the voice we all know. Um, so we broke it down phonetically and I went over it as many times as I could and it transforms throughout the show. You kind of, cause that's the other thing too. It's like, he's young. He's done when I start to play him, he's playing, I'm playing him at like 21 mm. and then I play him all the way to 39. So there had to be a, a bit of a shift in how comfortable he was with his own voice. Mm. Um, and I know my voice, if you looked at interviews of me in 2016, you, you sound like this. I do. <laughs> I actually kind of sound so crazy. Hey, I'm Kevin. And I also had a New Orleans accent. I don't really oh. have one anymore. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really it was a unique challenge, but it was it was the gift that kept on giving. Mm. Dear God. Thank you for this blessing that you bestowed upon us. And thank you, God, for this precious love. Hey, Brown Sugar. Hmm. Turn that radio off and come dance with me. <laughs> we ask you for peace and for guidance. We ask you to watch over us, to protect us as we fulfill your purpose. Please align our hearts with yours and our will with yours. You are some big old feet. Like my big old feet. We ask you for strength and faith as you guide us on this path. And, I mean, you played so many, uh, you know, great uh, people in our history from B.B. King to 
Fred Hampton, Chevalier, uh, uh, and and now playing uh, Martin. Uh, I'm, I I wonder if you took something from each of those characters, and if so, like what do what do you want to take from playing the character of Martin Luther King that you want to just keep inside you from uh, you know from embodying that character? Um, the protection of their identity. You know, each and one of those men were like, I am who I am. I love what I love. I come from where I come from. And you shouldn't take that away from me. Mm. And if anything, I really would love for you to embrace it because it can teach you something about yourself. And that's been the takeaway I have. That's how I try to move through this industry. That's how I try to move through my life. And um, that's what kind of keeps people being people. So, yeah. yeah. That's good. Um, <laughs> um, Coretta Scott King was not only... Um, the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King, but she al also was an accomplished activist, uh, mm -hmm. uh, op opera singer, <laughs> leader in her own right. Um, how did you balance portraying her support for her husband's mission along with her own contributions as an individual? I think um, learning about Coretta, she'd always been a driven person. One thing I really loved about her tenacity, her strength, her boldness. I mean, we she was an activist before she met Martin. And so I think when they met, it was kind of a blending of both their worlds together. But again, they ultimately had similar views and had similar goals. So I think that's what helped it um come together. But um I think she it, it just, yeah, their goals meshed. And I think that's probably why they were such a wonderful match I say that they were equally yoked because I think that they honestly had the same amount they had the same energy you know what mm -hmm. I mean they wanted the same things they understood that they would have to go through certain things to get there they knew about you know perseverance and patience and they just they clicked so it's it's beautiful to to know that that's how I think they got together and Coretta was still her own person. Mm -hmm. You know, she wasn't just serving his purpose. It was their purpose. It was an yeah. our thing, a we thing. It wasn't, she's putting her life aside for Martin because they both had the same vision, I believe anyway. So it, I don't think she, I mean, she even her singing, she didn't have to completely deny it. But, and this is something I also want to point out. A lot of people think she just abandoned the singing to jump on the bandwagon with Martin, but she didn't in fact, because uh, she had been cast as the lead in La Boheme, uh, the opera. And uh, when she got cast, she found out she could not perform in every state because of segregation. And so therefore, for her fighting for the equality of all people, other people, like if someone had fought for it before her, she would not have had an issue to not perform in these places. So, you know, fighting for the movement and desegregation was not only beneficial to Martin, it was beneficial to her as a performer, as a woman, as a person, as a black woman, as a black person. And so their, their um, goals were not um, opposite. They weren't mutually exclusive. I think they both had the same vision and just slight differences, but it all worked together. So I don't, yeah, she, it was for her as well. It wasn't just Martin's vision, it was their vision. And I think that's revealed in episode uh, three or four. There's so many things that, you know, while watching this that um, that I've learned that I, that, that I didn't know. I know you spoke mm -hmm. about the Martin and uh, Michael thing be before on an interview, um, Kelvin. But um, but like I didn't I didn't know about the stabbing uh, with the with the letter opener. I, like I had I, I had to Google that. Like is this real? <laughs> as soon as that happened? Um, so I mean. The, can you, I know you talked about Michael, but like, can y'all both talk about some other things that that just what that y'all didn't know about um, these characters uh, that was really glaring when you learned? Like, wow, is this is this true? Did, did this happen? Why didn't why I never heard about this until till now? I'll say something I learned um, during the show. Uh, one of the I think the sit-ins when Martin got arrested at the sit-ins in real life. He, he got arrested and Coretta called Robert Kennedy to say, can you help my husband out? And he calls the judge and then helps Martin out. But by doing that, um, Daddy King got involved as well and they kind of um, endorsed the Kennedy campaign. And then when uh, JFK uh, was running for president, because of his affiliation with 
the Kings. JFK got almost 70% of the black vote. I had no idea. So Coretta's one phone call, I believe, in my humble opinion, was somewhat responsible for JFK becoming president. Mm. I had no idea. And that for me just then elevates her even more because I'm like, yo, she's a president maker. I also love how you played it too in the show. You did. Yeah, because you do it in such a way that's so like like you you you're taking it one day at a time. You're very mm. present in that in that exploration and that you know what I mean and in, in, in gathering that information to for the man you love, but also for a bigger love, you Listen. know. But it, it's just it was really elegant. I like it. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Um having uh having GPB and uh, Reggie Rock at the helm, I mean I, I know when when Spike did, uh, you know, Malcolm and uh, well, did X and uh, when Ava did Selma, we got portrayals of Coretta and we got portrayals of, of Betty, but having such a power couple that champions each other that, you know, uh, knows what they have contributed to each other's, you know, uh, success. Like, do you think that had a lot to do with how um, rich the characters and how much that you could see both uh man and wife and their contributions to um the struggle together that you have these people at the helm that are man and wife and that are been you know superheroes to the culture and into the arts themselves i love superheroes to the culture that's cool i like that language yeah i definitely think so i think um i think we have a better understanding where a partnership is and that's one of the things i took away too from the show was knowing how they support each other how they listen mm. to each other how they handle disagreement um, and what they, what's, what does knowing beforehand what you're signing up for, mm. do we share the same philosophies of life? That's why I think it's such a beautiful scene to sit there and kind of be like, let's talk about your favorite philosophers and such and so said and such and so said, and what do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just like, every, you know, she's, Coretta's really funny in the book because she's like, he really did on day one, ask me, tell me that <laughs> the four things he requires in a wife and that I got them. That's wild, but at the same time, there was there was clarity, yes. and I think a lot of us sometimes. Well, I don't know. I sometimes move sometimes without clarity and knowing what it is that I'm looking for, and um, it can it, it not choosing the right part partner can can derail your whole Listen, your whole purpose. That's one of the biggest decisions you ever make in your life, make or break. And like I said, I think they were equally yoked. That's like we both know exactly where we're going. And we're in this together and having that knowledge, you know, finding out on the first day. And I listen, if a man said to me on the first day, ma'am, you tick all the boxes, let's move. I'm going to be a bit scared, but it's wonderful because you know what you want. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I think it's just the power of black love as well. You know, showing that the partnership is just be it's beyond the feelings. You know, it's purpose driven as well. And to see that and to know that it's possible and to know that it works is just so beautiful to see and just it for me it literally ignited like a desire and a hope that I can have that too and so it's beautiful to see mm -hmm. that black love that black love mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I also wonder like I remember asking Chadwick Boseman this after he played, portrayed 42 and and he had, you know, these baseball players calling him, you know, nigger and Porsche monkey and all this stuff. And as an actor, I know you're in the scene, but just as Black people, how does it feel to be in that situation where you're hearing this vivid racism, you know, put, you know, directed at you, at your character, you know, at, at least, and you're playing, like, how does it, because I know, like, we deal with racism, all, you know, all the time still, but but to have that in your face, um, you know, front row racism as an actor, like, do you feel the pain of it when you hear that? Or like, how, uh, how does that feel to go, go through those type of scenes? I mean, you definitely feel the, you definitely feel, it. I mean, it's our job to make ourselves available and open to it and to receive it so we can react um, honestly and authentically so that people can recognize themselves in it. But at the same time, you know, we've worked really hard as a community on sets to find intimacy coordinators and therapists and people to be on set when we're in those situations. So as soon as they say cut, someone comes up to us and say, are you okay? Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel? Do you want to keep going? And so there's always someone to unpack it with now. Yeah. And that's really beautiful. We also have each other. Um, 
And then I always like to remind myself, and we talk about this a lot, is it's a privilege to be able to recreate these moments and not have to live in them in, yes. in reality. Yes. And having that separation is really important as well. Otherwise, you go, I've done movies where I've decided to, to think this was all real. And, you know, it's not cute. the bill for my therapist afterwards was, was really high. <laughs> so... <laughs> I don't want to do that no more. <laughs> tap in, tap out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, great job, uh, both of you. Uh, Kevin, it's, it's hard to believe it's just been like eight years since you've been on screen. I don't know if it was Monsters and Men or what I first seen you in, but um, it's just hard to believe just all those projects has just been, since 2016, you you put in a lot of work in a, in a, in a, a relatively short time. Keep doing your thing and, and same with uh, with you, uh, I know that you know after this portrayal that you know people are going to be throwing a lot more media roles <laughs> at you. And, uh, and thank you guys for putting the integrity and the responsibility that portraying these characters like deserve to you know when it's on screen. So I thank you guys and I uh, appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you so Emily. much. Those words are so kind. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. I appreciate you for your thoughtful questions as well.